All right. Let's get cracking. All right. Okay, let's go. Who's going? Are we? Uh, are you, is it going to be you, Ash, or is it going to be me today? <laughs> I'll take this one, mate. I'm cool, ready. mate. Let's do it. Hi, guys, and welcome to the Lunge and Lift podcast. Today, we're talking about all things recovery. We have our seven top tips for improving your recovery with a view to increasing your performance. So I think this is a hot topic in amateur as well as professional sport. The topic of whether you're overtraining or potentially under recovering. I think for me, most people aren't doing such a ridiculous amount of exercise that it's actually impossible for them to recover from. So I wouldn't say they're overtraining. I think with some lifestyle adjustments, they could increase their capacity to recover from the training and uh, yeah you could class that as under recovering rather than over training if you wanted to get into the semantics of it what are your thoughts Rob? Yeah I definitely agree it's like when anyone has a goal in particular a lot of the time you see people go balls to the wall head down I'm gonna go absolutely berserk and just do everything I can which is great because you've got a lot of enthusiasm, which is amazing because that's what gets that ball rolling. Now, unfortunately, with once that ball is rolling and you're putting all the output in, people don't even take into consideration their recovering, uh, their recovery part of it at all. And that's obviously where then the the overtraining and under recovering comes in. And mm. normally they then go to the extreme of right, I'm not going to have this food, I'm not going to drink this drink, I'm going to now eat barely any food, and all these. So if it's a weight loss goal, whatever, and it's all these things happen, and then you just end up finding that they just burn out. And, yeah. that's, and if they would have probably took their foot off the gas a little bit and maybe thought about cool, okay, recovery is just as important as the output because. Most of the time, what people forget is they're only training for potentially, say, one to two hours, not most people, one to two hours a day, say, at the most. So you've got all those other hours in the day of where you can be doing either good or bad things towards your overall goal. And recovery, I think it is something which is definitely a hot topic to the point where people are being a bit more conscious, especially within the functional fitness space. Mm -hmm. um and also when in just general all over the place you know people are being a lot more aware of what's actually going on under the hood and people can take it to some extremes but you know i think some of our tips that we we're going to go through today i think really um identify some clear things that you can action today and then take away and then hopefully in your performance so so I, I think if we start with number one and that's surely got to be the wearable so having having things like we have whoops uh, so our whoop bands and aura rings and many other so data capturing things that we can wear that give us these stats of what our sleep's like what our training is like calorie steps and all that lot so they all kind of give us all this information so it's about what we take from that so the very, I say one of the most important parts is the HRV. So your heart rate variability, because that's going to be depend on how essentially how healthy you are. So Ash, what is HRV? HRV is, yeah, like you say, heart rate variability is what it stands for. And it means the beat to beat variation. So let's take an example. If somebody has a 60 beat per minute heart rate, and somebody else also has a 60 beat per minute heart rate, one of them could have each beat exactly every second, like a metronome, and the other one could have them a little bit more irregular, so beat, 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 beat. <laughs> yeah, you know, nice. little different gaps between the heart rate, but they're still 60 within the minute. The second person is actually in a better state in terms of their physiology because it's a measure of how well their heart rate responds to their environment, responds to their circumstances, because within any given minute, you're asking your body to do a few different things and the energy demand will fluctuate. So you could be sat in a chair, then you stand up, you sit back down. Every action you take, there's a slight difference in the energy requirement. So the blood requirement, the oxygen requirement uh, for muscles in your brain. So if your heart rate varies a lot, it actually shows that you're responding very 
accurately to the change in that energy demand. If your heart rate is rock steady like a metronome, it's basically indicative of a slight state of stress, which means you're not able to perceive the demands as well. And your body's just like, I'm panicked. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to pump out blood at this steady rate that I think is appropriate for most circumstances. And um, it's being used a lot nowadays as a stress uh, indicator, which we can then um, extrapolate to be a marker amongst other things for your recovery. So if we look at WHOOP, I've had a WHOOP for a couple of years now, and their recovery score is a secret algorithm but it takes into consideration uh, your heart rate variability your resting heart rate how low you get overnight your sleep quantity and quality and uh, based on their little algorithm they'll uh, give you a score each morning to say you are x percent recovered with 0 to 33 being poor 33 to 36 being medium and above 66 being strong or a green recovery and uh, their advice is basically depending on how well recovered you are should have an influence on how hard you train the next day because if you're in the red your body's pretty run down it's pretty stressed out so adding some more stress through hard training is probably going to be a bit too much for the readiness that you have um yeah because aura so the aura ring is another like wearable that you can use which so instead of a uh, say wearing around your wrist it goes around your, your finger hence or a ring and uh pretty much gives you the exact same sort of stats you know body temperature also um they call it a readiness score rather than necessarily strain so that's like your overall so when we give a percentage from whoop we're saying your your readiness there in a way it's there they have a pretty much a similar approach i actually just recently sold my aura ring and um mainly because I kind of felt like I had a Samsung and everyone had iPhones, <laughs> so uh, which was yeah. great because I originally stopped um, I stopped using my Whoop because I was I was finding myself comparing my say stats to other people, and so this is where I kind of wanted to come back into this bit because it's, we all have different heart rate variabilities, and even if say we have a uh, say someone has like 150 heart rate variability and someone else has 90. It doesn't necessarily mean that the other person is that fitter per se, but it's just because they have a different heartbeat and a different, which we are all individual little butterflies. So, so yeah. these, these six, so it was initially, that was my, my like gripe with it is I, and that was gripe with myself rather than anything that I was comparing mm. myself and then <clears throat> got the aura ring and it was great, good stats, you know, absolutely loved it. It wasn't a subscription service, which is, was the better thing of it. Um, but yeah, I just, I was just like, oh, yeah, I could, it, was just, <laughs> it was just that FOMO, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, but yeah, so, but the wearables, it's like, it's a really good starting place for anyone that wants to take the next step into their recovery and kind of get a bit of an understanding what's under the hood. Now, people say you should be able to intuitively do this, but nowadays we find those type of things hard because there's so many other stresses in our life and it's really hard to then actually take a moment and clear the noise. Yeah. So exactly. I know it's gonna we're gonna kind of cover one of those bits a little bit later, but it's like it's so important to try and become in tune with your body and using something like the whoop or aura can kind of help you start to understand some of the stresses that you put on the body and how it, how it affects exactly. and how it affects you and stuff. And I think that's that's massively key. And you, you don't need these things, but they definitely enhance your recovery game. Massively. And I think something that we say very often on the show is what gets measured gets managed. And if you're trying to improve your recovery, you need to measure it somehow. Like It could be as simple as every day you wake up in the morning and you give yourself a score out of 10 for how good you feel in terms of mood or how well you think your training session went and you track that over time and see if that's improving. Obviously there's a, a high degree of subjectivity with that and there could be a lot of things going on um, and it's not necessarily an objective fact-based uh, criteria. Whereas if it, you've got your wearable and you've got your resting heart rate, which is pretty accurate, and you've got your heart rate variability as facts they are like assuming the device is reasonably accurate there's not going to be 
uh, subjective component to evaluating your recovery. And one of the features that I really like about the Whoop actually is they've put onto the app a journal function, which basically means every morning when you wake up, you tell it what you did yesterday. So if you had alcohol, if you had caffeine, if so, how much and at what time did you do intermittent fasting? Did you meditate? Did you um, take CBD oil? All these different questions which you can set up and it basically tracks those behaviors against your recovery score. So after a week, after a month, months down the line, it can give you insights to say on days when you meditated, you got 20% more deep sleep on mm -hmm. days when you had caffeine after a certain time, your sleep duration was less and you can see really tangible uh, and actionable insights yeah. to further improve and make more informed decisions. So if your sleep's worse when you drink alcohol, you can say, okay, maybe on a Wednesday night, it's not worth it, but <laughs> on the weekend it is. And the yeah. Thing, yeah. On, on that, the um, just before we finish up on this one, whenever I've had a couple of beers, when I say a couple, well, it, it depends. Um, but it just blows my mind when I see, because I always have, have this wearable on, no matter what it is, or at all route. And my resting heart rate would be around, say, 90, 95 beats a minute. Now, if you just think about that, so essentially, like, doosh, 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 continuously all night, and yeah. I think I'm asleep. And you're just yeah. like, okay, admittedly, it was like you're passed out from, say, eight, nine beers or something. But it's like, that's your heart rate. So it's like, and no wonder it's like you don't feel recovered. You essentially had a workout for, like, say, five, six, seven, eight hours, whatever it is. So it's no wonder you're stressed. And then it's like, yeah, so, but I just think um, to, to kind of round this up was I, what I love about Whoop's thing was that summary, monthly summary saying, cool, when you've meditated, when you've had caffeine, when you've done all these things, this is what happened because it's very easy to forget those things. And it was yeah. very hard to say, because uh, that was one of the features I really loved about it. But something I needed to uh, check my own self against was to not, whatever my score was on the day to not think that's who I am because that was where I started to say right okay oh it says say 32 percent oh man that means I shouldn't be doing anything today it's like no no what that's doing that's it's giving you a guidance and saying look today might be a better day for maybe maybe a rest day or maybe a little bit less stressed than normal it's giving you advice it's not saying you are a Mr 32 percent or Mr 32 yeah. percent so it's taking it as it is and then making your own decision and that's where you said there about giving yourself a score that was something i started to do which really helped i was like cool how do i feel today and obviously i wouldn't be able to see straight away or feel because i've just woken up so normally after say my morning walk or whatever like that i'd i'd sit there and actually check in with myself and say right mm. how do i feel today and then i'd be able to give me so then i'd look at my whoop i was like cool okay six seven percent oh sweet i feel about i said about seven out of ten so that's about right. So it's a nice thing to do. And then that's you seeing if you are actually getting in tune with yourself. Mm. So it's something I actually look forward to doing back again, because that was one thing I felt with Aura is in like, I didn't have the opportunity to say, cool, I had caffeine at this time. I had alcohol at this time. So my scores were clear and everything like that. But there was no then data behind that score that, yeah. I, that I was able to, that I absolutely uh, did. So <clears throat> on that, I guess that leads on to point number two, which is sleep. Yep. And obviously, we've mentioned there how alcohol absolutely destroys the sleep, which I think is a given, which hopefully most people realize. And when you do pass out from alcohol, that's not good quality sleep. Nice. So <clears throat> sleep hygiene or getting good. What, what would you say there for like quality of sleep? Why is it important for recovery? Why do you need to have good sleep for recovery? Ash? Why? Um, well, sleep is actually a big mystery in science. We know that we need it and you go psychotic in a few days if you don't like clinically psychotic people do all sorts of crazy shit when they've had um sleep deprivation experiments and um, so we know that you absolutely have to do it and if you don't get enough the incidence of a lot of diseases goes through the roof so there's a, a book that was quite popular a year or so ago by matthew walker on called, called why we sleep and um not to ruin his sales, but I can give you the summary. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> you get loads of diseases if you don't sleep. Yeah. Um, and if you do sleep, then uh, you are 
Sorry. It's that, on that, it's worth listening to the, if you haven't read the book, listen to the yeah. Joe Rogan podcast with yeah. Matthew Walker. And as you say, it's going to ruin his book sales, but it pretty much summarizes it. And it's, it's an entertaining watch and a listen. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, the, um, yeah, the key message is if you don't sleep, you're going to get this disease. If you don't sleep, you're going to get this disease. <laughs> and, um, then the, the key tips. So bringing it back to our recovery, uh, sleep hygiene, basically to have a good sleep environment. The key criteria are your bedroom should be cold. So now that we're moving into winter, just leave the window open for an hour or so before you get to bed so the room's nice and cold. I think the optimal temperature is like 18 or 19 degrees. There's also something that I really want to get called a chilli pad, which is Mate, basically... I'm, 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 I'm getting one. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm getting, I'm getting one because I've, yeah. So this, this is, this I can't. Hannah's like, I don't need the double one, so you get a single one. But apparently, it does like a little humming sound as well, like so white it's a bit noise, of a yeah. white noise. And yeah. I'm like, I'm all over that because I'm just such a hot individual. Yeah, same. <laughs> so for those of you who haven't heard oh, of the chili pad, it's basically it's like an electric blanket, but instead of having a heating element, it pumps water through the through the layer under your uh, bed sheet. And you can choose the temperature so you can uh, decide to have it hot or cold so if it's cold and you want it a little bit warm it actually will heat the water up slightly but whatever you choose is your preferred temperature it's like you know when you get into bed and the sheets are, are cool and crisp yeah. it feels really nice the you cool basically have that <laughs> exactly you basically <laughs> have that the whole night long that's great and, uh, so why why would you yeah. want that why would you want a cold bed so coolness or cold is a trigger for rest and recovery, and it's part of the fall into sleep process is that your body temperature drops down. So we can basically trick our body into kicking off that process sooner and staying in that um, state. Obviously, in a normal day, the night is colder than the daytime. So we can emphasize that contrast in our homes because obviously you're if you're living in a building it's not exactly the same as being so exposed to nature as we probably evolved yeah um, and also everyone has different preferences just like you said there's like say i in my room obviously hannah sleeps next to me and she's she's comfortable she has good night sleeps to a degree and stuff like that whereas like, i can't go and shove the window open because i want to be cold and then because yeah. i sleep better like that even though we all do sleep better most of the time colder so yeah. you just had to be conscious that this blanket is going to be like an ideal solution. Like <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Um, so it's got to be cold. It's got to be quiet as well. So obviously in London, that might be tricky if you live near a road or something. Um, solutions to that are either like a white noise machine or a white noise soundtrack through a little speaker, um, just so you don't notice the noises outside or obviously earplugs as well if you're not bothered about the discomfort that they might cause to keep yeah. it nice and quiet the white noise just on that um so there i think they there is studies out there saying how how good it is to have a form of like continuous noise so like like these white noise machines or anything like now our personal experience and stuff like that so when we had chloe you get all these like crappy baby things like you and the sheep and stuff like that, playing noises like baby songs and stuff right mm. but then we downloaded an app on our phones, like White Noise Machine, and was doing that absolutely destroyed our batteries and everything. So, but we then bought a cheap machine off eBay, plays for eight hours. You literally press play, and you got a couple of different noises, and it's just pretty much just in a way we've got like a like a white static noise kind of thing. So it just nice. does that all night, just so again, and it, it settles, and it just means that then any little noises in the house you're mm -hmm. not getting distracted by, it. and I think yeah. that's the idea behind the white noise is that the exactly. little things don't wake you up so you can stay in your state of rest yeah spot on and uh if you don't have a white noise machine you could just do a wayne rooney who famously used to have a hoover on all through the night <laughs> so that's his form of white noise maybe not the most energy efficient but no. work for him um so we've got cold we've got quiet and the third one from a hygiene point of view is dark so there have been studies where apparently in a pitch black environment, if you shine a red dot on the back of somebody's knee, it will interfere with their sleep quality. Uh, so that's how light sensitive our bodies are. It's not just the eyes that can detect uh, 
the, the light. And the mechanism for this has evolved basically because in our circadian rhythms, our body clocks, we're regulated by daylight. So it's one of the reasons why if you travel and you want to get over jet lag, they say make sure you get exposed to as much natural light as you can so that your body can detect that it's now daytime, which is different to daytime wherever you come from. And uh, so if you can't, well, first thing is to get a dark room, obviously a good set of curtains or blinds so no light comes through the window from street lights or anything like that. Remove any devices with an LED. So if you've got a TV in your bedroom, cover up the LED or ideally turn it off um, so that there's no little yeah, lights or dyes. And if you can't get rid of as much light as possible, wear an eye mask and uh, at least protect the eyes from any uh, yeah. sleep disrupting light. Yeah, because I mean, my in my so not only is my room say warm, so we've, <laughs> so we've got that. So we've got a warm room. We've got the white noise, which is good, mm. but then I've got two night lights. So um, yeah, it's not ideal. So all that blue and uh, things like yellowy. As a radio, you know, no wonder my sleep so bad at the moment. So I'm going to have to, I think my uh, experiment is going to go back onto the floor tonight. So the route, I'll have a cooler bottom. I won't have the lights in my eyes and uh, yeah, hopefully I have a better night's sleep. Interesting. Make sure you get it in the journal, mate. So <laughs> I will, you can tell I will. if it works or not. So I think that flows nicely onto the next bit because bedtime routine, I guess, is key because mm -hmm. what we want to do is have the same kind of process every single night so our body goes right it's time to wind down time to go to sleep let's get ready to just shut down and recover so what are some of the considerations you you maybe put in place when it comes to your bedtime what is your bedtime routine ash because i know it's very yeah. different to mine <laughs> yeah um so typically on a like on a week night i'm trying to get a good night's sleep the main thing is getting off screen devices uh, try and set a curfew of by 9 p.m. latest. I get basically put my phone on charge and try not to watch TV or be on the computer or anything like that. A couple of reasons for this. One is blue light is very stimulating. It um, is the trigger for telling you it's daytime. So like we just talked about for getting over jet lag, As the blue end of the spectrum is what our body uh, perceives as the indicator that it's daytime, which uh, triggers a lot of hormone, hormonal responses to basically keep you alert and yeah, energized for a, a day. So in caveman times before there was artificial light, that wasn't a problem because the sun would go down and there'd be no blue light produced. Whereas nowadays we've got artificial lights, we've got like, um, what are they called? The, uh, light strips I can't remember, neon lighting and oh, yeah. uh yeah all of our screen devices are very bright so if we're using them it's basically telling us that it's daytime even if it's not um the second thing is if you're on your devices whether it's a phone or a computer generally you're getting your attention um stolen from you by notifications pop-ups emails essentially stuff that gets your mind turning even if it's just messages from your friends you know it triggers thoughts and mm. keeps your brain active which is not really what you want when you're trying to wind down and switch off for the evening so getting off the devices um, is an important part of the bedtime routine dimming the lights uh, if possible so if you've got side lights rather than bright spotlights like i've got on now that also helps with the um, blue light and signals down regulation to the nervous system to say we're getting ready to rest. Some sort of calming music or white noise, something to, <laughs> again to just set the scene. Not saying I do this every night, um, but this is a, in a perfect world. And um, what else? What else is there? Like, oh yeah, having a cold bath or shower to help bring that body temperature down. We'll talk about that a bit more later and then something just having a regular process of say you shower um you brush your teeth and then go and read in bed mm -hmm. having that protocol it acts as a form of it's like almost like pavlovian conditioning your body mm -hmm. 
knows that when these three things happen in this sequence it's time to rest and the routine like well maybe it'd be interesting for you to talk about how your experience with chloe with mm -hmm. kids giving them that routine so they know what's coming and uh this process sets off a chain reaction of now it's time for bed yeah well i wish it was <laughs> that simple mate um but the reality is is uh, having a routine is key yeah. now it's like for me i make sure i charge my phone outside my bedroom and same with hannah's phone or any electronical devices out our room bar the white noise machine um that for me i put my phone on airplane mode i put it on charge and that's the trigger for me that i'm now getting ready to and i've now stopped any any outside interference coming in and triggering thoughts because as I say, nothing good happens at night, right? Well, not now. When it comes to notifications, you don't want, you don't want to be told <laughs> things because otherwise, as you said, they're going to be playing on your mind. You'll be lying in bed. You've already got probably plenty of other things going through your mind that you don't need even more yeah. uh, information coming in. So <clears throat> for me, it's, it's I have a, a similar process. I put that on charge. Um, normally, I have a shower, so I go have a cold shower. So I have a hot shower followed by finish off with a cold. I then do some breath work as well. So I use um, an app, State Breathing. In, no, is that in state, state breathing, uh, basically black square with a white dot. Um, really, really good. Basically, as you get better, it adjusts as you go. So I think it was made by Brian McKenzie. Mm. So one of the guys behind, obviously, like the whole nasal breathing thing. So really, really good app. So I follow that as I fall asleep. There's like a feel alert and all those bits. So do that. And then I go into the bedroom where like, Chloe is and she wakes me right back up. So it get, gets my adrenaline going again. But um, because we're trying, we obviously then read her a bedtime story and so forth to get her to know that, cool, this is now your bedtime. You're starting to go to sleep and it's actually my bedtime as well. So I've started, I've realized I was jacking my heart rate up by when I was reading her stories. Mm. So I was getting way too, I was like, and the Gruffalo said. And, it was, <laughs> and she was like, actually, no, I was like, now I'm just like, and the Gruffalo said, da, da, da. so I'm saying it in a more calming way to hopefully yeah. calm her down and calm myself down. So, um, but yeah, um, we've got blackout blinds with, you know, we try and get that process and like Chloe knows once the light's gone off, like, and that that's it. And the white noise machine goes on as soon as mm -hmm. that white, she knows, all right, it's now time to go to sleep. So, and then unfortunately with Hannah, so my wife, she, um, ha does a lot of her work at night. So it kind of goes against a lot of the things, but she does, she wears her blue light glasses, like blue light blocking glasses to get, and it's not great but it's just what she has to do because obviously during the day she's looking after chloe so that night then she's she's doing her work so it's um you know we we try and put these say strategies in place but sometimes you know life is in the way so mm -hmm. obviously as you said your your routine is like an ideal scenario it's not always going to happen like that, but we try and get that or we try and get as many mini wins as possible so if you could take at least one of those things that we've just said from there for like a nighttime routine and start to see how that affects your evening thing I think everyone could benefit from getting their phones out of the bedroom and just not be. And like, if you're not falling asleep, do not put on YouTube. I know we've all done it, but you know, you go down a YouTube hole and all you're doing is being stimulated and you're just like, yeah. and then you fall asleep and it's just bad quality sleep. So, but um, I think we're talking about stimulation, like from that caffeine. Now that's obviously number one. Now, why are we going to talk about caffeine when it comes to recovery? Well, so caffeine post-workout actually improves your recovery mm. however caffeine late in the day is one of the best ways to fuck up your sleep basically <laughs> <laughs> especially for me um so caf quick bit of science on the mechanism of caffeine basically a caffeine molecule is very similarly shaped to a uh, adenosine molecule which is a neurotransmitter that our bodies naturally produce and it accumulates through the day as an indicator of fatigue and tiredness so as your adenosine builds up your body's like oh i'm tired and starts to down regulate slow down so caffeine doesn't give you energy it blocks a tiredness signal so that's the way it acts as a stimulant and um, people vary quite a lot in terms of how well they can break down the caffeine molecules and it's usually measured as like a half-life so in X amount of time, the amount of caffeine in your blood flow is halved. And it varies from four hours to 40 hours. Mm -hmm. So somebody who's very caffeine sensitive can actually take days to clear caffeine out of their system.
um and those people probably know who they are they probably get a massive headache and feel wired for yeah ages after just one cup of coffee but then on the other end of the spectrum some people can have several coffees and they uh don't feel much of a buzz and they can probably sleep relatively okay afterwards and one of the mechanisms uh, why we're talking about the adenosine that's important here is the more caffeine you drink the more you need to drink so your body actually builds more adenosine receptors to because it's like hang on a minute i'm producing all this adenosine but i'm not actually uh, perceiving any of it because the caffeine is blocking all your adenosine receptors so over time your body will grow more adenosine receptors which means to block the adenosine signal you need even more caffeine and you get into this uh, vicious cycle where you need more and more and more caffeine and when you do eventually stop that's when you get the withdrawal symptoms you get the pounding headaches and like there's a guy I used to work with and he used to drink I think almost like a couple of liters of Pepsi Max every day. And he just went cold turkey. And for two or three days in a row, he literally fell asleep at his computer because <laughs> he had accumulated so much fatigue and was just living off borrowed energy um, that, yeah, he was just a, a mess. And uh, one of the ways I explain this to my clients is caffeine is basically an energy credit card. So you're borrowing energy from tomorrow and that's fine as long as you pay it off every night with enough sleep in the same way that if you pay off your credit card every month, you won't get yourself in much trouble. However, if you then go over your monthly earnings in terms of your, so relate that back to sleep over your daily sleep, you can get yourself into uh, a lot of debt. And basically this is where people get sick when they go on holiday because they've just accumulated so much um, fatigue over weeks because they're living off caffeine energy rather than actual energy and uh, yeah you got to pay it off in one way or another yeah I think when like being like uh, someone who is a bit of a caffeine fiend I had to really <clears throat> take a take a look at what my what I was doing because when we got our coffee machine I got very carried away, was having like five double espressos, like with making flat whites and stuff like that. So I have like a black Americana, then probably like a double espresso, then I'd have like three flat whites. And because I was practicing the latte art and I've got quite good yeah. at it. I'm getting better. Yeah, I've seen that, man. Um, so I've been practicing, but I then started, so then I said to myself, right, no caffeine after 12, but I was still having five coffees before 12. <laughs> So then I go, so then you talk about the half-life malarkey. Yeah. Think about 10 single espressos, how long it's going to last on me. Now, yeah. I might I might be able to, I'm someone that can have a coffee before bed and go to sleep. I don't have an issue with that. So I will sleep. But it kind of links back to that alcohol analogy is in like, is my quality of sleep going to be there? Because if my heart rate is slightly elevated and stuff like that, then I'm not going to be in that resting state. Mm -hmm. So I might be asleep, but the quality, I'll basically be, I'm just pretty much there with my eyes closed. That's yeah. essential. So I won't really get, I'll be in that light sleep phase, never really getting into my deep sleep or REM sleep. And when it comes to like recovery and stuff like that, you're for like muscle recovery, you want the deep sleep for filing away your day's activities and stuff like that. You want your REM sleep, so learning and all those bits. So you need to make sure you're getting these other parts of your sleep. But caffeine is it can it can be a tricky one and i noticed because i because st yeah. i stopped having um energy drinks yeah and so i went to wit the other day and uh had a knocko because i had the limon one which is really nice mm -hmm. and i haven't had one of those in ages so i had that and i just like that night i could just feel my heart like, whoosh, whoosh, yeah. whoosh, and i was like oh geez so i was like and that was just and it wasn't because i could knock back plenty of them with no issues but now, just because it's such a concentrated thing of caffeine, which is great for training, as you say, like post-workout, yeah. pre-workout, it's, it's great. But is it far enough away from your sleep where it's not going to affect you? Mm -hmm. That's something you do want to take into consideration with all with all caffeine supplements. So um, I think <clears throat> when it comes to like that side of things, ha caffeine can really upregulate things like stress and anxiety. So when it comes to recovery, I guess if you're really stressed or you're anxious, your recovery is going to go to pot. So what are maybe some of the things that we could do to kind of maybe help reduce stress and anxiety to help with our performance recovery? Great question. Um, so one um, concept 
I think is really important to understand is that stress is stress wherever it comes from. So whether it's from training really hard, that's a stress on your body, whether it's from work and being overwhelmed uh, because you've got too much on your plate, that's also stress. If it's from your relationships, also stress. Your body just has a stress response. It stimulates your sympathetic nervous system. And that is going to impact your recovery because you're on this in this state of heightened alertness. So your sympathetic nervous system is basically fight or flight. Your body's getting ready for high energy action and it doesn't want to be passive in case there's danger or threat or yeah your body's going to call into action so some of that is necessary to stimulate adaptation especially if we're training and trying to get our body to to adapt in a certain direction however if we have that chronically and we have too much of it then our body's never going to get into that parasympathetic or rest and digest uh, state so if you feel like that, you're stressed and anxious, probably my, well, one of my top tips for that is meditation, uh, mm. which I've done on and off for probably, probably eight or more years now, maybe. Yeah. And the days when I do meditate, it just feels like you have more, it's like, there's a football analogy. It feels like you've got more time on the ball. <laughs> like you have a bit more space to think about what you're doing mm. rather than just being head down and grinding away just being very reactive to whatever yeah. gets chucked at you you actually can st take a step back and think right what what should what should i do here what's the best thing to do what do i want to do and um there's loads of options for how to get into it there's tons of great apps out there between headspace calm i think uh sam harris has got one called yeah waking, waking up. up great one that's really good I'm yeah a big fan of that one yeah so those would be the first places to go to for me in terms of just building it in whether it's in the morning or the evening it doesn't really matter in in the evening is actually how I started to help me get off to sleep uh the only danger is you might actually fall asleep <laughs> during the meditation yeah. and uh yeah how about you mate have you done much meditating uh, I've gone through periods the same similar to you um definitely I've felt so I used to use Headspace uh, quite a bit and then I used Sam Harris's Waking Up. And for me, it was more about because it's guided meditation. So someone kind of talking to you for a duration, kind of telling you like maybe ways that you should think and stuff like that, how, like triggers that you should be thinking about. Because at the end of the day, meditation should be an internal thing. So, mm. so you, as, as we mentioned about earlier, we're about learning about you and t checking in with yourself and seeing what you think is going on. And meditation is a great way for you to address stress, address all these things. And because at the end of the day, as you we've mentioned quite a little little bits along the way and like notifications pulling our attention. We've got so much trying to get our attention when we meditate. It's the time where you have nothing but yourself. So you only have your internal dialogue. Now, that could be going rampant. But if you that's where meditation over time will start to give you so that rampant like raging noise turns into something that's a bit more clap with a bit clearer so it's a bit more clarity and you can really start to take it in and just feel good now for me i i tried it at night and i would fall asleep and it's and it's and then it goes against the it goes against what it was so what i what my kind of meditation routine is is uh, after my morning walk i try and do one most mornings and it's about 30, 40 minutes. Uh, so it's normally knock out about 5,000 steps. That's a good good uh, step target to kind of mm. try and do. But without that, it's also a form of like active meditation. So I'm moving along. I'm breathing in and out through my nose. I'm taking in the surroundings. I'm listening to a podcast or whatever like that. I then get back and then I take a moment and listen to, say, Sam Harris or just take a moment myself and just take a couple of deep breaths and try and just stay in that zone. Then at night, when I use that breathing app, it's mm. not a meditation, but it's a form of breathing. So I'm focusing on one thing, which is essentially like what meditation is. So I'm doing my breathing, which is putting me into a state ready to go to bed. And all of this performance, like recovery stuff is all about changing your state and trying mm. to get you into an opportunity to be able to rest just on that um a uh, equation which i really like that i saw uh, jamie alderton put it out and it was just like stress plus rest equals growth because that's mm. true you need stress you need rest 
then you can grow, but you won't grow without either of those two. So it's mm. pointless always trying to look for the least stressful way. You just need to learn how to manage that stress. And for me, that is a is a, is a great is a great um, equation. So yeah, meditation. It might be a bit woo woo for some, but it's definitely worth just downloading one like these apps, Headspace, um, Calm. Sam Harris is waking up. So they all do free trials. Give it seven days and see how you feel it's you know don't expect to be oh i'm now like some zen buddha like i feel thing but it's it's just more do you feel better than you was seven days ago so um now that's one i kind of lightly touched on that but point six movement so you using movement as a way to to de-stress now mm. is wouldn't movement stress the body more could do could do so the type of movement and the intensity of the movement is very important if using it as something to recover with so things that would help with recovery could be yeah like a nice walk like you're talking about or very low intensity cardio so you're looking at like zone two or even lower just to get the body moving and again it's that sort of moving meditation point yeah. where you're trying to just focus take yourself away from the stresses of the day so getting maybe out of the office or away from wherever your work is getting into nature breathing some fresh air just having a little bit of a, a reset obviously there's you get some blood flow benefits you're um, flushing your tissues through with some fresh oxygen more so than if you're just sat still you're circulating your lymph system as well and um, it can be very calming especially something like yoga where there's a lot of focus on the breathing and meditation kind of through the session depending on what style of yoga you do and it usually ends with a bit of shavasana when you're just in <laughs> yeah. corpse pose and uh, <laughs> yeah that's the best bit for me yeah. um so uh, yeah movement is a great uh tool in your recovery like you're not going to recover very well if you're just sat behind a computer all day apart from when you train nice so i think Lastly, to finish off, we kind of alluded to it a bit earlier, but point number seven is cold exposure. Now, that can be from cold showers, that can be ice baths, that can be jumping cryo. in the cryo, yeah, cryo. There's all there's all, all these things, but basically, it's making your body cold, and it's very uncomfortable. It can feel very disconcerting, essentially, and in a way, it can actually stimulate you into feeling more awake if you then especially if you pair it with like some Wim Hof style breathing or something like like deep breaths deep hard breaths so you're again you're changing your state into more alertness but when we're talking about recovery and stuff cold exposure then starts to put you into that state of where your body drops down the temperature so your body can say okay cool I'm now I'm now ready to start recovering I'm starting ready to to switch off because it's cold mm -hmm. like that cave analogy it's now nighttime so your mm -hmm. body's like, right, sweet. It's now time to get ready to go to sleep, get ready to calm down. So you signed up when I was doing cold showers and I, I still do, but it's when I, at night, cause I was doing them in the mornings and then get my day and I felt great after them. And so then when I added them at night, having a cold shower before bed just meant that I would actually feel a little bit more alert initially. Cause I was like, fuck, this is cold. <laughs> and then it's like to get, get the breathing under control and stuff like that. I do my breath work, but then my heart rate drops, and then I get then I get into that state of okay, now I'm ready because I've, again I've directed my breathing and I've I've kind of told myself I'm using this cold because it's now time to sleep rather mm. than I'm using this cold to get myself alert and you know change my state into a more alert state. Definitely, I played around with cold baths a while ago for sleep. I wasn't brave enough for ice baths, but yeah, cold water is cold enough in England, <laughs> yeah. and it was a very similar experience in that initially it's quite stressful because you're like fuck this is really unpleasant yeah. i don't want to be in this and you, you have this urge to just get out but if you overcome that and just sit there um there's a funny thing like basically if you sit still your body obviously warms the water immediately <laughs> next to your skin and then as soon as you move it, it flushes <laughs> yeah. it away and you get exposed to a whole new way of cold water it's horrible so you're just trying to sit there as still as you can <laughs> to build up a little insulation layer um but obviously the bath is a lot more aggressive than the shower and brings your core temperature down yeah uh more profoundly and even like five minutes i think was, i don't know if i did five or ten minutes but you get out dry off get into bed and literally out like a light i don't think i've ever mm. i don't have trouble falling asleep really but 
you literally get in and it's like you blink and then you're asleep and then you open your <laughs> eyes and it's eight hours later it was you're like, yes. it's phenomenal <laughs> yeah it's just it feels like you've you've not won the whole night yeah but there is a high price to pay in the discomfort of sitting in a cold bath uh, yeah. or bed might do that yeah, so yeah I, I i'll be having my cold shower because the thing is is i wear so chloe has her bath and stuff so then after that i can then i can have my time to, sh- to shower and stuff and it's just like i really wish i could then just go straight to sleep that'd be so good because then i would get that straight effect so mm. i'm gonna i'm gonna try my best and i cannot wait for that chili pad um but yeah so we really hope you guys have taken some from that so just just to recap our seven points that we've spoken about so we we spoke about wearable so using things like whoop or rings or any anything like that to basically track your heart rate variability to kind of basically help you whatever gets measured gets managed so you can see what's going on under the hood so point number one point number two was sleep we want to start talking about sleep hygiene so thinking about things about in your bedroom what is your environment like we then obviously had your bedtime routine making sure that's consistent we then obviously spoke about caffeine and the effects of that and how it can start to either be a performance enhancer but also it can also be something that takes away from recovery so we want to be conscious of that we then spoke about obviously meditation to help with stress and anxiety and also movement through stress and anxiety and then we obviously just finish off there with cold showers and cold exposure so if you guys have got any tips that you'd like to do for your recovery do let us know we'd be willing to and wanting to hopefully maybe experiment some other bits to help with our recovery i'm always looking at ways to try and boost my uh, hrv score and stuff like that so i'm always up for new things so just throw throw them uh, throw a suggestion our way thanks a lot as always for taking the time to listen to this podcast hope you've been able to get something out from it as always you can find it on apple Podcasts, youtube spotify all the lot but until next week thanks a lot for your time and we'll see you then thanks guys